Howdy, Immortalium here, and today I'm going to be reviewing the complete series of Samurai Executioner, uh, which is actually the first Kazuo Koike series I've finished. Um, I'm still in the process of reading Lone Wolf and Cobb, I'm not, I, I'm not even halfway through that series, so uh, this actually takes the record for the very first Kazuo Koike I have finished. So let's start off with the story. So what is Samurai Executioner about? Samurai Executioner is set in the late uh, 1700s, uh, in Shogunate Japan, and basically the name Yamada Asaiman is a title given to an executioner for the Shogun. The current uh, Yamada Asaiman is introducing his son for the role of uh, Yamada Asaiman. And uh, just a bit before the uh, son takes the position of Yamada Asaiman, uh, his father actually orders him to assist him with seppuku, uh, which basically the father stabs himself in the gut, disembowels himself, and then the son, uh, or an assistant executioner, that's how it usually goes, has to decapitate uh, him in order to end his pain. Uh, which is, you know, very traumatic to the lead character. And in fact, as it says in that chapter, is the only time in his life that he actually cries. So a very, very interesting beginning uh, to the whole story. Now, beyond that, uh, this series is actually very episodic. Uh, so what I mean by that is that unlike, for example, Lone Wolf and Cub, which is an episodic serial, in that all the stories are kind of standalone, but they all build up to, you know, um, a kind of overall story. Uh, this is simply a case of, um, you know, generally th the basic plot is we are introduced to a character uh, who is either about to be executed or is, you know, doing their job in life and uh, they do something wrong and they're going to be executed. And we find out about them, we find out how they got there, uh, we find out what their motivation was, etc, etc. And it usually ends with Yamada Saiman finally, you know, decapitating them. Uh, that's the basic premise for a lot of the stories. Not all of them, necessarily. There are a lot of stories uh, which focus differently. Maybe focus on Yamada Saiman himself or focus on some other characters. Uh, but in general, they are, as I say, very episodic, with very little continuing aspects to them. Um, and of course, as with any episodic series, that means the actual quality of each story is very important. Um, which, in this case, there are a lot more hits than there are misses. Uh, the majority of the stories are very good. We find out a lot about how life was on, in Shogunate Japan, uh, about how the prison system works, how the execution system works, how the police force works, and of course the everyday life of people. Uh, because, in the end, it is the everyday man and woman who is being executed by Yamada Saiman. Uh, so we find out a huge amount about uh, the time period. In fact, one could, like, it is fair to say that this is a period piece. This is, uh, you know, something that you read in order to kind of ingrain yourself with the kind of society that Japan was at the time. So uh, that's how it kind of goes. Um, now regarding the ending, there isn't really a conclusion, so to speak. There is kind of a kind of a wrapping up of the kind of theme uh, of the overall, you know, series. Uh, but there isn't really a conclusion as in like, you know, a kind of a proper ending. The, the last story, in many ways, is kind of a normal story. Uh, which I didn't find too problematic. The, it didn't help that the story itself wasn't exactly one of the greatest uh, stories in the series. Um, it was a bit on the weak side, to be honest. But the actual way that the chapter ended was pretty good. So I was pretty satisfied with the actual ending, if not the actual the story that the ending appeared in. So that's kind of my basic thing about the story. So basically, in general, episodic, very good in general. You know, most of the stories are fantastic. There's a couple of iffy ones here and there, a couple of ones that I didn't really care for. Uh, but in general, very strong. And uh, you find out huge amounts about the time period. Now, about the characters. There's actually very few kind of continuous characters in this series. So let me start off with Yamada Saiman, who is the main character in this series. Although, um, I'm trying to recall, I honestly cannot remember the last time that a main character had so little quote-unquote screen time in a series. Uh, because, as I said, the majority of the uh, stories are focusing on the people that are going to be ultimately executed by Yamada Saiman. So, in general, like, I wouldn't be surprised if less than a quarter of the pages in this entire series have Yamada Saiman in them, which, you know, I find very, very interesting. Uh, but for those bits that he is present in, uh, he's a very interesting character. Um, I just want to start off 
by saying that he does look in many ways very similar to Ogami Isho, who is the lead character in Lone Wolf and Cub, to the point where one could easily confuse them if you, uh, you know, were only given the visuals for them. But beyond that, they are very, very different characters. Ogami Isho from Lone Wolf and Cub is very nihilistic. He believes that, you know, humanity is ultimately bad and evil, and that uh, he himself is going down the evil path, and, you know, he's willing to, you know, do some pretty nasty stuff in order to achieve his own goals. Uh, whereas Yamada Saiman, even though he knows that what he's doing isn't exactly great and he's ashamed of it, uh, he does believe that in the end his actions are ultimately going to be good for mankind in the future. Uh, so he has a lot more kind of hope in mankind, I guess you could say, and he's not anywhere near as nihilistic as Ogami Isho. Also, there's this other strange thing about him in which he actively kind of tries to prevent himself from developing. Uh, what I mean by that is that if it wasn't for the way that it's handled, I would almost say that, you know, he's not very well developed character at all. But the character of Yamada Asaiman himself actively prevents it. Uh, basically, he refuses to take a wife and have it in the event because he's afraid of getting her pregnant and her having a child and the child then having to grow up to become what he is now, which is the executioner, because he had a very bad childhood. He didn't like the fact that, you know, he ended up having to go into this profession. So he wants to prevent, you know, his child or children or, you know, his, well, I should say non-children from ever going into it because he doesn't have any children. Uh, he also kind of prevents, in general, actually building relationships to people. Uh, in general, he tries to keep stuff very professional. Now, there are, there is a character that I will go into in just a moment that he actually does kind of build, um, you know, a kind of relationship that kind of softens him up slightly. But, in general, he is a very static character, but one that he himself has actively created to be static. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't argue that he's a badly developed character. He is preventing it himself. Uh, and, in general, he is a very interesting character, very wise and everything. The only thing that kind of disappointed me was that because he had just gone into the executioner profession at the beginning of the series, I was hoping that we would see a bit more of him kind of learning the ropes, of being a bit unsure, etc, etc. But very quickly we find out that he's very skilled, very wise, etc, etc, and he, you know, is able to do everything, pretty much. So, I was hoping for a bit more on that side, but in general he's a very good character, a very good main character, despite the very little screen time he has in general. Now, that other character I mentioned, who is the only character really to have an ongoing plot is actually a man called Kasajiro, who is a policeman. And basically, we when we first meet him, uh, he asks Yamada Saiman in order to assist him in um, helping to save people, uh, particularly in hostage situations. And Yamada Saiman assists him and, you know, it goes on like that. And at first I thought that was a normal episodic story, and then a couple of stories later, uh, I remember seeing the uh, character again, and I kind of thinking to myself, wait, we're actually seeing this guy again? And uh, throughout the entire series, there are actually many, many stories devoted to him in particular. In fact, there's like two or three stories in the final omnibus, which is actually completely devoted to him and his life, which actually do not feature Yamada Saiman at all. Uh, so throughout the series, we're actually seeing a development of a kind of a side character, a recurring character, uh, which is a very interesting way to contrast the kind of non-development that Yamada Saiman uh, goes through himself. Because Kasajiro, uh, without spoiling too much for him, uh, let's just say that he does lead a properly developed life. Uh, which, you know, cont contrasts greatly in t um, into um, Yamada Saiman. Also, it helps to, you know, show the passage of time. So those are the kind of two characters that are most important to discuss. There is one other character who actually does appear in multiple stories uh, in particular and has a lot of focus, but it would be a bit of spoiler territory to talk about them. So, you know, you can just figure it out for yourself. For those two characters, they're pretty good characters and they, you know, ver work very well in, you know, showing how different they are from one another and developing the themes presented in the story. Now, the artwork in this series is particularly interesting and is one I wanted to discuss. Um, if you are familiar at all with Goseki Kojima's art style, you will know that it's very different from, uh, you know, the more standard manga style. For one, he fully embraces the Kikiga style of the time, which was aiming for more realistic uh, art. So what that means is that, you know, characters are more proper proportioned, uh, you know, they look more realistic than your normal manga character. But what I also love is the fact that he incorporates a style similar-esque to Japanese uh, painting, uh, which gives it a very stylized look. 
And so if I can find a pretty good page here, this would be a pretty good page, um, an example to show here. Uh, so as you can see, oh, it's a little hard to actually see there. Um, as you can see, uh, the characters are pretty realistic looking in comparison to most, uh, you know, uh, manga characters. Uh, more realistic looking eyes, a lot of the detail in shading. Uh, but in general, actually very stylistic looking. Like, it's got a very kind of a, a brush strokey almost feel to it, which I absolutely adore. And also, like, I, I will say that backgrounds are generally pretty sparse. Uh, but in general, they are actually really gorgeous when, um, you know, you actually do see them because, um, you know, Gokuseki Kojima just absolutely knows how to actually give that beautiful painterly feel that a lot of Japanese paint strolls have, you know, that kind of almost, almost faded but not quite backgrounds. So I absolutely adore his art style. And in terms of paneling, actually, I will say that he has improved from Lone Wolf of Cub, or at least the Lone Wolf of Cub I saw. This series started about two years after Lone Wolf of Cub began, and I remember one of the biggest issues that I had with Lone Wolf of Cub in terms of its paneling was the fact that um, there were these paneling bits that he would do, in which he, it would be like a panel that would go across two pages, but it wasn't like a double boom page, it was just a panel that would stretch across two pages, and quite often I would, you know, be going into it, uh, I would read, I would read like that, a part of that panel, and then move on to bit downwards only to find out that I actually have to go back up and read the next bit. As you can imagine, a bit confusing. In this series, pretty much, I believe there's only one instance in which I got confused by the paneling throughout this entire huge series. So it became, you know, it was a lot cleaner, it was a lot clearer in which direction to go, etc, etc. Um, overall, he has, imp he improved from Lone Wolf and Cub as a mangaka. Uh, not necessarily as an artist, same level of detail in general and character designs and all that as Lone Wolf of Cub, but as figuring out how to panel, he has mastered it uh, much better. Uh, he's become better at uh, paneling. So I guess the last thing I should discuss is how Dark Horse has treated it. So the additions I have are actually the omnibuses that were released recently. There are four omnibuses in total, and they are massive books. Um, the first three omnibuses are close to 800 pages, maybe more like 780 pages each. Uh, with the last omnibus being about 700 pages. It's a bit smaller, but not by much. Um, so they're very large, and uh, the paper quality in general is pretty nice. Uh, you know, very strong whites, uh, very clear blacks, etc, etc. And uh, very little to no page bleeding, which is very impressive. Uh, the one problem with, uh, you know, this release, I would say, is that they are a bit awkward to hold. To the point where, uh, this will say something, I actually developed a bit of tendonitis in my hand. Uh, at one point, because of reading of these. Um, it was only brief, like maybe a day or two, and then it recovered and it didn't occur again. But I just do have to say, not the most comfortable reading experience considering how vast and chunky these uh, releases are. But, you know, you still get like fantastic value and all that, and maybe if, if you don't hold them the way I did, then maybe your hand will be able to fare better. There are no color pages, I should point that out. And it is flopped, so you read it from left to right, the artwork is mirrored. And also, the there is a lot of uh, Japanese terms, terms that could not be translated directly into English. And so at the back, you actually have uh, glossaries explaining, you know, various uh, Japanese terms. Which, you know, I found really helpful. The one thing I would have liked is if they had, like, a clear page, a blank page, uh, separating the very end of the omnibus and the glossary. Because if you're gonna go back to the glossary, you're gonna see the very last page of each uh, omnibus, uh, which is very annoying, as you can imagine, particularly when I got to the final volume because I didn't want to see, you know, how the manga ended, what the last panel was. So, you know, I, I wish that Dark Horse had actually just separated out the glossary from the story a bit clearer. Uh, but beyond that, it's a pr pretty good glossary. It explains all it needs to do. Um, so you will learn a lot about, you know, Japanese terms around the time period. Um, and overall, um, I also should probably point out the trim size. It is not quite Japanese size, Japanese Tonkaban size, but it is slightly smaller than the, uh, than the normal Tonkaban size that we are familiar with. So, if, for example, my trusty Yatsuba, it's this much smaller, which is, you know, pretty much negligible. You know, very little difference, as you can imagine, but probably worth pointing out that it is slightly smaller in general in comparison to the average Tonkaban. So, Overall, what do I think of Samurai Executioner? It was a very good series. I really enjoyed it in general. Um, I don't think it's quite as good as Lone Wolf and Cub. I believe the character of Ogami Isho is ultimately more interesting than that of Yamada as Saimon. Uh, also, I found find you know the serialized e episodic no episodic serials I should say 
um, more interesting in general than episodic storytelling. Uh, but still, this is a series that I can highly recommend to people who are looking for gritty period pieces, uh, pieces that are dealing with, you know, the, ver the general lifestyle of the time in Japan, how the prison system worked, how the execution system worked, etc, etc. Um, and also, if you want to, uh, you know, continue to go on with uh, Kazuo Koike's uh, storytelling and Goseki Kojima's art style, you will not be disappointed from going from Lone Wolf and Cub to Samurai Executioner. They are two different animals, but they are both excellent representations of the storytelling that they employ. So, uh, overall, highly recommended. Um, I really want to hear what you guys think of this series, if you have read it. Um, if you have not, you know, what have you heard about it, etc, etc. And uh, thanks for watching, don't forget to comment, rate, subscribe, and bye-bye.